had a chance to review. I uh, take entertain a motion to. Uh, okay. Second. Okay. All in favor of adopting the minutes of the September 24th uh, Budget and Finance Committee, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. All right, let's continue down the agenda. So let's talk about the Treasury report. I'll turn it over to Marie to give us a quick update. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Um, the October Treasury report's before you. This is for the uh, four months in fiscal year 16. Um, as far as our revenue base is concerned, for the month of October, we posted $19.8 million, um, roughly 2.6 above what the forecast was. And for the year to date, we're posting $73.9 million, and the variance is a positive of $7.3 million. Um, the majority of that positive variance is due to fees um, for customers that were in the collection um, phase of the, of the invoice cycle for toll by plate customers. Um, so about half of that is related to our toll by plate customers on late fees. The remaining portion is due to just positive um, traffic projections. We're about 8% above transaction-wise from what was forecasted. Um, and we're going to work with our traffic and revenue consultants in the next couple of months um, to see if we need to do a revision to the budget. Um, I don't anticipate that that trend will continue for the fees, um, but we'll give you a report, obviously, month to month to make sure that we, you know, we're on target on that. Um, but it's still very positive results. Um, on, the, on the operation... Question, Maria, and just before I lose that train of thought. Um, what you're saying is we had a, a good revenue increase, but that to expect um, that this is a continuing trend, this is just kind of... Uh, this is not what would be the usual norm of a $7 million increase per month. Correct. I think the, the, the traffic trends are there. I think we're starting to see some um, positive results from the construction projects that are coming to completion, the interchange. Um, and I think, you know, traffic is flowing um, pretty well and people are choosing to ride our system. So I think from a standpoint of the traffic projections, the traffic and revenue consultants may have over projected of what the diversion or traffic may, may have been, and I think there's more positive results than what was projected um, back um, last year when we put forth the budget. Um, you're correct, Mr. Treasurer, on the fees. I don't think that trend is going to continue at this level. Um, on the operational side, which is um, Steve Andrew's budget, um, there, he's pretty much on track um, to what his budget is for the four months. Um, year to date, they're a little bit over on postage, and that really related to um, getting the bills out for toll by plate, and I think they're doing a good job in that area. Um, but I think that um, they'll be within budget um, uh, with the remaining part of the year. Uh, roadway operations, nothing really to speak to. Um, you know, roadway operations is the traffic man uh, management center, and that is a lump sum plus a, a task authorization amount. Um, so that is, again, on track. Um, Maintenance-wise, um, again, that is right on less than 1% of the budget. So the maintenance folks, which is uh, Juan Toledo's area, is on track as well. On professional services, the only area that I just want to point out um, is on the professional services and on the legal services. We're over budget year to date, and that mainly is due to the litigation um, for ETC, and which we're all aware of. Um, so overall, year to date, um, for net revenues, we're about $7.5 million, which is really actually the revenue um, uh, positive variance expenses are, are right within the budget, about 1%. So I think uh, all in all for the four months of fiscal year 16, very positive results, Mr. Treasurer. What, Marie, just to clarify, when you say very positive results, we're less than half of a percentage point underneath that 0.35%. Is that correct? Within budget. Yes. You know, I, I, can you improve upon that, please? I really would like uh, if we can get that to... Uh, well, on the, on the expense side, a lot of times we, we, we get measured on the total, total expenses. And, it, you know, we will always ask, do we over budget, um, you know, are we a little bit too conservative in our budgeting? And on the expense side, we're right there 1% of where the budget is. So I, I think expense, expenditure-wise, we're right there. On the revenue side, you know, we're about $7.5 million above. But again, as I explained in the revenue base, yeah. that is really due to the forecast. I, I, I was being sarcastic for those of you who are not here and can't understand my humor. This is great. To, you know, we're right on target, and this is, a, this is a great place to be in from a financial perspective, and our projections are in line with what uh, you can't get any closer than, you know, 0.35% of a point here. So thank you very much. If you want to continue, anything else you want to add? No, sir. 
Moving right along. Yes, sir. Mr. Cancio. You know, the utilities, $6,000 more is because we have some water running. Because uh, that was, you know, it's, it's a very small amount in, in this uh, operation budget, but $6,000 is too much to me. In the utilities? From operations? Right. So operations was $19.8 million, and then we budgeted 13. And that's just really kind of how the bills come in, Mr. Concio. It, you'll kind of see next month will be, you know, a little bit under the budget. But year to date, when you look at the column year to date, the expenditures are right about $9,000 below the budget. So I think, again, it, 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 it's just for the month. Does that answer your question, Mr. Concio? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right, I uh, guess moving on to uh, agenda item C, endorsement of the CAFR for 215. And I guess we have a speaker. Marie. Correct. The um, item C is for the fiscal year 15 audit of financial statements. Mr. William Blen is the audit partner the, that's in charge of the engagement. Um, as you recall, back in September, I presented the preliminary financial statements um, to the committee. And for the most part, the, those statements did not change. And then uh, Mr. Blen is going to present his audit findings as well as his audit procedures. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 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 audit, Mr. Chair. Uh, should we move the item before the presentation? How is that possible? Uh, unless you can give me a compelling reason, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, because there may be some questions, I'd like to hear Mr. Blend uh, no, speak. Absolutely and then uh, I, I've done it both but, ways. But I also, if you have some, no, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. If not, you know, let's just listen to the presentation. We'll answer any questions and we'll uh, move forward. Um, thank you, Mr. Blend, for being here. We've had the opportunity, and in your audit, I was one of the people that sat with you and uh, you asked questions of the audit. So, yes, sir. I, Good to see you again, and good to go see you, uh, Mr. Treasurer, committee members. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee as well as MDX for allowing us to serve as the external auditors, um, and I'm here to report on the June 30, 2015 financial statements. In addition to going over the financial statement information, um, I need to do some required communications and then open it up for any questions. So. Just the first thing, kind of covering required communications, our responsibilities, our responsibilities as your external auditors is to ensure that we perform our audit in accordance with the, all the applicable audit standards, which include things such as the AICPA audit standards, rules of the Auditor General. Um, this year, the uh, MDX did not require a single audit. In past years, you generally have had a state single audit. That, that requirement, we were just under the threshold, so we weren't required to do that this year. Management's responsibility is, in essence, summed up in the idea that they are to provide us with information in a timely manner um, and provide us information that is accurate, and that was done. Internal controls and compliance, we evaluate internal controls for the purposes of doing the audit. We look at various things, um, purchasing policies and procedures, uh, internal controls over disbursements, internal controls over receipts, and we evaluate the toll operations. I will point out something that we look at on the procurement side is we do a sample selection of procurement transactions, look at the bid package, make sure that you're following the uh, policies and procedures of your organization. And, and for actually every year that we've done that as your auditors, we haven't had any findings in that area. In addition to that, I could point out for you that uh, you actually had I think it was either last year or the year before, I can't remember, maybe Marie can remind me, the Auditor General came in and also evaluated your purchasing policies, and they didn't have any findings either. So in that regard, uh, you know, just as one of the many areas that we look at, you know, you, nobody's found anything there. So you're following your policies and procedures, which are in accordance with state law as well. Uh, significant matters, no significant matters to report. Management's representation we did receive, or I actually will receive before I leave today, the signed management representation letter. A signed individual, Marie, is assigned to oversee our audit. So again, you know, our responsibility is to, to this committee, to the board, and to the, you know, the riders of MDX, the, the folks that are in the vehicles, is to make sure that the information is accurate and that we perform our audit in an independent manner. So uh, we've done that. Um, the audit schedule. I think we've met that audit schedule as presented in our um, 
previous communications to you at the start of the audit. So that's all I have as it relates to required communications. I would just open it up if anybody has any specific questions as it relates to these items. So in summary, you after you conducted your audit, uh, we're in compliance with uh, state and bondholders, and we're doing what we should be in, in short. Yes, sir. Things of any discussion, and that's the purpose of our requirements to have this uh, annual uh, audit and to ensure that we have an external auditor like yourself to oversee our policies and all of our control measures and to, in fact, ensure that we're compliant. Correct, sir. Okay. So, okay. Yep. Yes. Did you have, you have some questions or you said to open it oh, up? Oh, yeah. For no, I'm opening up for questions as it relates to required communications. I'll, I'm going to go through the financial statements in a second. Board so members, just, if you just hold on, then we'll, we'll let him finish. My apologies. Okay. No, that's okay. I was. Um, so going into the, uh, the, the, the deliverables that we're required to do, so uh, for the audit purposes, the audit report itself, that's the report on the financial statements. I can tell you that you received an unmodified opinion. That's on pages 11 through 13. Um, you know, that's the, from an external auditor's perspective, that's the highest level of assurance that you can receive from any public accounting uh, firm. Auditor's report on internal controls, I, I just went into the details about kind of what we look at, and we had no findings on that report as well. Um, report over compliance and internal controls, uh, again, you didn't require a, a single audit this year, so we didn't have a report, we won't have a report related to that. And the independent accountant's report, this is something that's required by the Auditor General. Um, it relates to your uh, investment policy, and we didn't have any findings as it relates to your investment policy. So in other words, you were following Florida statute in that regard. Um, in the management letter, there's various things that the Auditor General requires us to um, speak to, uh, and, and we had no findings in that report either. Financial highlights, so if we kind of look at obviously a very high level overview, you have the complete document which is very detailed, has a lot of more detailed information, but if we just kind of look at things, current ratio is strong, remains healthy at a 3.55. I think any of us uh, that work in the business world would appreciate that kind of uh, current ratio, so current assets to current liabilities. Your debt service coverage ratio, you clearly meet that requirement. Um, your outstanding uh, bonds to operating revenue, so again, looking at what you have available there. Um, again, all healthy positions there. We see assets versus liabilities, and then your obviously the biggest portion of your net um, assets or net position is going to be in your investment in infrastructure, so your roads and things like that. Looking at your operating revenues, uh, and I'll get to this in a second, but you can see a in significant increase in there, and I'll, I'll speak to that on the next slide. Your operating expenditures not don't certainly have the same increase, but obviously if you're going to have an increase in revenues, you're going to have associated costs with that. And then we look at non-operating revenues, uh, things like interest expense for the, is the mo largest item there, um, pretty in line but in accordance with your bond uh, requirements that you, you know, have to pay and what the interest rates are on your debt. And then your change, obviously, there was a significant increase, and again, I will speak to that as it relates here. So really just kind of going over some of the highlights, uh, we have the new GASB implementation of 68, which requires that the pension liability that you have with FRS be put on the financial statements. That's done. It's discussed at a high level in your MD&A, so if you want to get the high-level overview of that, um, and if you really want to get into the details, there's about seven pages within the financial statement notes which discusses uh, the pension liability and that reporting. So all of that information has been reported in the financial statements. Um, you're all aware of the dividend program that was instituted this year, and that's being paid out, so that's been accounted for in these financial statements. So getting to that significant increase in revenues as it relates from SR 836 and 112, so you had a rate increase as well as the activities, and also in it, contributing to that increase in revenues is the toll by plate. Now that things have been settled with ETC, you've got a full year of that activity, confidence by management uh, in that information and, and full reporting of that. So all of those things coming into play have uh, resulted in that increase in revenue. So now I would open it up for any questions as it relates to the financial statements. That would have been the time now to say that you had no findings and all the comments that I made before. Uh, but Good. thank you for, for the audit. Let me open it up to uh, board member uh, comments and questions. Yeah. Mr. Kansu, I think you had some questions earlier. You know, I don't know if it's with the CPA, but, you know, I asked, you know, the, or the executive director 
to give me some information and he gave to me, but you know, maybe not to the public and the people who are in the internet about the 2015 asset disposal of $10 million and also the three million or nine hundred and something thousand dollar but you know that the 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 debt of the that we are not writing off. And also I would like to know because before when I came here they told me that you know in the Central Boulevard asset to the Miami International Airport there were about thirty nine million dollar and now I see that this about $68 million. I would like, you know, some clarification in that. Okay. Um, I had the same question, Mr. Concio, coincidentally, and I had a conversation with Marie, so um, uh, Marie would be the, the person to, to answer that. Wait. Um, Bill, there's a, uh, an agenda item in front of them, and okay. part of our requirement and part of our policy is not only for this committee to act at, as the audit committee and accept the financial statements, um, that Bill just presented in his communication to the audit committee. Um, any assets that are written off the balance sheet um, were required to go to the committee to get approval. Anything that's over $200,000, I must come to the committee. So in this action item, not only to accept the financial statements, is the write-off that occurs during the fiscal year. And there were three areas. The one area related to the recommendation from a general era consultant of the infrastructure assets. We did numerous projects um, in fiscal year 15 that completed. Um, so the assets that replaced them were placed on the books and the assets, the old assets were removed. In infrastructure, a lot of the roadway assets are long live assets. They're 25, 50 years. So they're long-lived assets. So when we go in and we have to repave it or you know, take out um, a bridge, decking, what have you, um, the recommendation from the GEC is that that old asset is removed from the books, the remaining portion of what's on the books, and then the new asset's placed into service. So in essence, that's what the $10.9 million is. It's the infrastructure assets. And as it relates to other assets, which is the receivables, um, Years ago, when we had the previous vendor, um, you know, we were in litigation with ETC. Um, we've had numerous problems as it relates to our toll by plate customers. Um, there were some accounts that were given to a collection agency about four years ago. And at this point, we've exhausted all efforts to collect that revenue. Um, so we've fully reserved it over the last four years, meaning that we allowed for the uncollectability of it. Um, so it had no impact on the financial statements on the, on the P&L, per se, because we already fully reserved that those receivables were uncollectible. So we're writing those receivables off the books um, in fiscal year 15. And then the third area is the contributions. Um, I will say, I know Gus was not here today, but I, I wanted to make sure that I, I mentioned that the assets that are contributed, we need to get approval from the committee. The assets that we accept, and there were numerous assets that the state gave us um, as it relates to the, the MIC. They gave us various roadway assets that were valued about $130 million, which we placed um, onto our books as an asset. But as far as it relates to Central Boulevard, the total project, including our contribution and the grant revenue, was about $69 million. That's the asset that we're giving to MIA, to Miami International Airport, and that's what they're going to book on their financial statements. So what we put on our financial statements was roughly around $30 million of the easement as it relates to Central Boulevard. So it was two separate transactions. So the easement is not shown here, which was $30-some million, and then the asset that we paid for as well as what the state gave us grant revenue for was the total amount of what the worth was for the Central Boulevard construction. And that's what we wrote off our books of $69 million, $67 million. Those are the three components of the write-off for fiscal year 15. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions to uh, Mr. Bland uh, while he's up here? I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, is it usual for agencies like ours to get unmodified opinions from CPAs? Unmodified? Yeah. Yes, sir. And these ratios, are they generally average in uh, agencies like ours, or are we exceptional in terms of the ratios that we have? I, I would say your, your, your ratios are strong. I wouldn't say they're way out of the norm. 
uh, they're certainly not on the low. I've seen worse. I've, I've seen some that are certainly comparable and, and a couple maybe that are better. But uh, I think you're, you know, you're, you're in a healthy position. I think when you look at the, the ratios that relates to the bonds to operating revenue, the 8.73, that's right where the rating agencies, you know, measure an infrastructure organization. Because for all intents and purposes, you know, we're a government entity, but what we do is build infrastructure. And that's the ratio they really pay, pay a lot of attention to. Okay. Any further questions of Mr. Blend? Well, if I could just speak to the things that Marie was talking about, a couple of things. Um, one, we're clearly aware of the AR issue that she discussed. We were aware of that. I can tell you that uh, we do, when we test disposals, we look for that approval that she's discussing. And then if you go to page 32 in your um, MDNA, there's a schedule of the assets in and out that she was referring to. So that information has all been uh, addressed. Okay. We will have the full audit report. We did put it on the flash drive because it's about 140 pages, but we did give everybody a flash drive. If you would like a hard copy of the financials, we, we will uh, distribute that at the board meeting. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Marie, I, I do have a question on the presentation, top levels analysis, change in net position from 25.6 to 54.9. Can we explain so that if anyone sees those numbers, are we more? Are we? Do we have a more a larger net worth? It, those revenues, net position. What are we doing with that so that well, me, it clarifies the situation okay. where some people net position is not a cash basis. I just want to make sure that you understand that net position is made up of unrestricted assets. Very good. Um, there's a difference between unrestricted assets on the financials and unrestricted from a trust indenture perspective, but that is not a cash position. You have prepaids in there. You have other assets. You have receivables. Um, our receivable as of the end of the year is roughly around $20 million. Um, so again, when it, you look at the unrestricted line item, that is not a cash position. Right. Those are everything else that doesn't fall into the other categories is what that really means. Okay. Thank you. I think that's a good point, Mr. Chairman, that you bring up to get clarification that we're not sitting on uh, that uh, cash flow as it is perceived or sometimes miscommunicated. Correct. For political convenience. No, they are what they are. Right. Okay, any more questions of Mr. Blen? Mr. Chairman, if I may, and, and I'll say this again at the board meeting, thank you, Bill, and to your entire team for the great work you've done with us. Thank you. Um, I think your agreement is coming to an end. Correct. Correct. We'll be recompeting or in the uh, process of recompeting. We certainly hope to have an opportunity to, to continue on as your auditor, so we'll but definitely be responsible. You know, publicly, they've done a, a wonderful job, and they've been very cooperative, you know, and it's been a, a good relationship, so thank you, Bill. You know, I, I, Mr. Mr. Troyer, I'd also like to comment and thank uh, the gentleman for showing his condolences for me and my Chicago Cubs today when he, we first walked in. He showed it. <laughs> <laughs> he showed it. He Thank showed some, he showed some some decent condolences, and since during our interview, we discussed my readiness for the playoff situation. So I do appreciate that as well. <laughs> there you go. Any further comments, or co questions? Okay. Mr. Blanda, I, I personally want to thank you again for the job that you guys do. I, I look forward to you guys being a respondent uh, in the coming uh, procurement. And, you know, we always like to see economies of scale, so we welcome a, a lower bid this year. So thank you. <laughs> for, uh, you know, funny thing about that. <laughs> Well, auditors are the only ones that ever have to compete with that lower side. Uh, we're trying to get that out to all the other professional services, but we just, we're just we accountants, so we're always tight. I guess. We, we do thank you for the work that you do. And, I, and again, just uh, for, 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 for summary purposes, uh, uh, it, it is uh, now been explained to us that uh, we're totally compliant and that no findings of any, uh, of any kind were found. And I think it's important that we note that for the record. And thank you for the work that you do. So with that said, uh, do we hear a, a motion, I guess, to endorse the uh, CAFR for 2015? I move it. Okay. Moved by Chairman Martinez, seconded by Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Move. Move the other two items that were discussed, which is the moving of the disposable income and the contribution of assets. Okay. So so can, disposable a fixed assets and contribution of assets to other entities okay. as well. So I, I, the motion has been made to, uh, and I think by Mr. Martinez and the second seconded by Mr. Gonzalez, uh, for the disposable fixed assets and other ac assets and contributions of assets of, of other entities. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. 
Anybody opposed? No? Okay. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Moving on to uh, discussion items. Citizens report for fiscal year 2015. And that will be uh, Marie. Yes, sir. Um, we passed out earlier um, the popular annual financial report. And this is, for all intents and purposes, a summarization for the public of the full financial statements. So again, we will have the hard copy at the board meeting. But the citizen's report is intended to be written that an average citizen can understand what MDX is doing with its, its tolls, how much we collect, where do we spend the money. Um, and the theme of this report is really honoring our commitments. It talks about the projects that we are using the money for. It talks about what the status is of those projects. And of the projects that we had um, needed the money for, um, pretty much all of them are under contract. Is, is that a fair statement, Juan? That they are underway, under construction, or they're under a contract. Um, I won't go through the full report, but I think it's a good summarization for the public to understand what MDX does, its small business program, how we partner with other organizations. And again, there's a summarization of the financials, very simplified to understand how much we collect and where the money is going. That's a great question. Uh, Treasurer just asked. Who gets this report, and how is it disseminated? This report, obviously, we do print out a hard copy. It's actually a little booklet. It's half the size of this. It's a booklet. Um, and we do put it on our website, so it is electronic. Um, and I know that um, Helen, when she does her small business events, she, she, she has it available for the community event and small business events. Um, so yeah, and Mr. Treasurer, I use it uh, regularly when I meet with elected officials or other folks. Right. Because it's a much simpler way to explain our our enterprise than to say, "Hey, look at our financials that are in the uh, in the uh, website." So it's been very useful the last few years. The other thing I want to state is this popular report, this summary report, isn't a requirement. We've chosen Correct. to do this for the last few years to explain it to the community. This is done in house by our staff. So, uh, so uh, the reason I ask that question, I think it is a, a valuable tool, if you will, for communicating what MDX does. And, you know, we're often uh, criticized for not communicating. Uh, and a lot of time misinformation is out there. And, and as someone recently told me, don't let the facts get in the way of what they say publicly. Well, this is a, I'm hoping that we can disseminate this at minimum to, uh, I think, uh, the people that are responsible for oversight. Uh, um, so I would suggest if we could send it to the county commissioner and the mayor's office to ensure that they have something to refer to, and it's a way of outreach, and I hope that the, uh, someone in their staff may take the time to read this and would clarify some of those questions. Um, so if that's possible, Marie, uh, to, the, to the mayor, deputy mayors, and, and then the um, uh, county commissioners, I think, would be something that I would suggest that uh, I'm willing to pay for the postage if, if needed. Uh, and I would further suggest, but I don't know if it's feasible, to include the legislature, at least from Miami-Dade County. Uh, I, while I'd like some selective members to read it, I know that I can't, uh, um, uh, can't guarantee that they will. But I would, again, further encourage that the Dade delegation um, receive a copy of this, and, and just with the hopes that the information may, um, may be read. So if that's not a major expense uh, that we can incur. Yeah. Mr. Concio. Looking at the page 10, uh, doing business, and I see that we have one institution that is not there and that is very important for us in Miami-Dade County. This is Miami-Dade College, okay? I would like to be at you know, the Miami-Dade College. Okay. okay. Right. All right, Marie, anything further on the report? No, I just I wanted to give everybody an opportunity before we went to print to take a look at it. And we can add Miami-Dade College to that list. Um, in, in you fact, know, if you go to page six, it lists out MDX's projects and, and then, you know, what we've contributed um, to various projects. But it really lists the total project cost. And as Javier said, but for um, reasoning, um, you know, the Inter Miami International Center, $1.6 billion, we contributed almost $100 million. The interchange was a $507 million project. We contributed $200 million. 
Um, so you could really see some of the significant partners we've done over the years um, and how much those total project costs were. So again, if anybody has any comments on the report, we, can, we still have time to modify or, or, or do some changes on there. Okay. All right. Uh, let's continue on with discussion item uh, that's cash back, uh, fiscal year 2015 update. Cash back update. Um, I first want to thank my staff um, because it, it, it has been a real lessons learned. Um, we're in the process of cutting checks and reviewing information. Um, Steve's been helping us, and Robert Garcia and, and from, from engineering has been helping us. So it's really been um, in-house staff that's been taking the lead of, of, of putting the program together. Um, we have learned some lessons about you know, what we need to capture on the website and so forth. Um, we did do some auditing, and you know, we do have some companies that are multi-axle vehicle that participate in the program um, that really are not part of the program. So I just wanted to make you aware that we're going to reach out to those folks to let them know um, that the program is intended for two-axle vehicles uh, because we have the multi-axle vehicle um, policy. Um, just a brief update, we are printing checks right now. We're, we're reviewing those checks, and we anticipate taking um, the cash back checks to the post office November 30th that week. So, you know, majority of customers will have their check in hand by that weekend or the following week. So we've met our target um, by early December to have cash back out to the community. Any questions from our board? No. Okay. Um, and I guess uh, any developments, but we'll, ha we'll hear the same report at the next board meeting, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, debt update. Marie? Randy. Oh, this will be Randy. Randy. Is a... Randy, tell us where we are and uh, what we're doing. And Randy tell... Topol with First Southwest. Um, we, we've been monitoring the refunding that we presented quite a while ago. It's been about nine months now. The, the process we've been going through is looking at a certain debt structure to accelerate, pay off your debt a little bit quicker. Uh, we're right at the threshold with the structure that we originally recommended. There is no room for error. We, we ran it Friday and it was 7.502 present value savings. So there isn't a lot of wiggle room, so we, we're not pushing it forward. The other thing I want to bring up is we we've want to make sure that it fits with your next capital plan. Uh, I understand that that discussion is going to be taking place next month, and I would feel uncomfortable going with a debt acceleration plan until I hear your needs and wants and make sure that I incorporate everything together. So I would like to put off the... the to go ahead until I hear a little bit more details from you. And for us layman people, when you say a debt acceleration, we were looking at doing 20 years versus 30 year. Uh, we, yes, we, we were dropping off uh, <clears throat> almost five years worth of principal amount. The average life drops substantially between our final maturity. And we were creating a downward slope and curve from a, a date in the future. Not right now, but a date in the future is about 2028. 20, I want to make sure that if you accelerate any plans, that I can accommodate that with this program. I don't want to get out in front and create any barriers for your decisions. Mr. Gonzalez? Randy, uh, we hear that interest rates are about to go up. How does that affect this plan, and should we be doing our capital uh, determination sooner rather than later to try to get you information so you can better uh, advise us on this point? The, we've been hearing that interest rates are going to be going up for the last four years. Um, the current Fed policy has made it clear that while they plan to raise rates on the front end um, a quarter point or so, in December, they also mentioned that they're going to take their time and evaluate how it works through the economy. While it would be nice to get in and get assured low interest rates, uh, I think good decisions are better than rushed decisions. And as long as it's in the first half of the year, I think you're going to be fine in that situation. And also with this refunding, the closer we get to the current refunding date, the less amount of negative arbitrage on some of the bonds mm -hmm. uh, starts getting eaten away. And if they do raise the short-term rates, it has a tendency to hold down the long-term rates. So 
It's a balancing act. I don't think you, you're, you should be rushed. Make a good, solid decision. Thank you. Okay. Good. Please continue with your report. And that's pretty much the summary of our report. Structure was exactly the same. Interest rates, as we just discussed, while the short-term rates have been volatile over the last month or two, we aren't seeing the same type of volatility we had the last time we saw uh, this type of unrest or terrorism overseas. Uh, the market hasn't been quite as volatile reacting to those things. I think I'm afraid we're getting numb to it. People have figured out that it doesn't change the world overnight. Any more questions for uh, Mr. Tobel? All right. Well, thank you, Randy, and uh, we look forward to, to getting a report, and uh, we appreciate you tracking and monitoring and doing what you do to ensure that we're successful. Thank you. All right. Uh, announcements. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we get into the announcements, if I may, because since the last time this Budget and Finance Committee met to now, there's been some developments locally that I will present them at our board meeting as part of my report, but because you're Budget and Finance, I think it's important that I give you preview of what's being discussed. Uh, over the last few weeks, at the MPO, State Representative Keone McGee presented one of his ideas. His idea is called Miami-Dade County 2.0. He basically took uh, SFRTA Tri-Rail, did a plan on how to expand into Miami-Dade County using existing railroad corridors, primarily the CSX Railroad. So he took those numbers, he took four projects that are priorities for Miami-Dade County, or at least that's what's been discussed, going west along 836 using the CSX, potentially going south using the busway or the current CSX line down to Florida City, going north using the tri-rail and doing some kind of a station between 79th Street and Golden Glades, and then going east into the beach, but that, there is no railroad corridor. <clears throat> so he presented his plan, and it was kind of interesting because he laid it out comprehensively to this, com to this MPO committee, and what he said was, let's use the People's Transportation Plan dollars that have been projected to be available. Let's use uh, state and federal funding uh, that might come available to build these four projects. And the fourth component is let's, let's let MDX be the lead agency to make it happen. And the way he presented it was, you know, a lot of folks may not like MDX, but MDX has actually delivered on everything they have said they were going to deliver, and they've got a proven track record of staying on time and on budget. And he actually challenged the board, the MPO board, and said, if anyone disagrees with that position, let me know right now and I'll get off of it. And an interesting thing happened at that committee. Commissioner um, Dennis Moss, who's always been a fan, advocated and said, you're absolutely right. They've always done it. But the more irony is, other than Commissioner Suarez, who still thinks that we're sitting on a pot of gold and we've got all this money that can solve every problem in Miami-Dade County, all the other commissioners that were on that dais, including the mayor of North Miami who sits on the MPO, Commissioner Francis Suarez, said, you know what, we got to take a step back and think what's good for Miami-Dade County. And maybe we should let the people that know how to do things do them. MDX can deliver. MDX is a tool to allow us to deliver. So they asked me to get up and speak. And what I basically said is that I view Representative McGee's presentation as an opportunity to use MDX's full tools available to it to put infrastructure in place. One of the components was, well, MDX can always front money. Well, not really. We can't front money unless there is a repayment guarantee before we even get into it. Because that's one of the things I've always advocated, and Randy, you're, now you can turn on your ears. You know, one of the things I've always advocated is financial sustainability. You can't get into projects that are not financially sustainable. You can't keep teasing the public on cutting a ribbon, and then you don't know how you're going to maintain or operate it for the, for the rest. So that was one of the developments that occurred at the MPO. Fast forward to last Thursday, or last Wednesday, right? Uh, yeah, last Wednesday. The Board of County Commission Transit and Mobility Committee met. 
That's uh, Steve Bobo is the chair of the Transit Mobility. Commissioner Moss is the vice chair. There was a discussion item on the Miami Intermodal Center. MDX, since 2009, has been asked to take a look at whether we could be the lead agency as far as governance for the Miami Intermodal Center to operate the facility and develop the land adjacent to it. This board and Secretary Pago, and I'm sorry he's not here because he'd be doing this report, but Secretary Pago made the presentation. And he actually had to take his hat off as district secretary, put it on as an MDX board member, and said that when MDX was approached with that possibility, the MDX board was very clear that the only way we can get involved is if it was a revenue neutral or revenue positive endeavor. That process started. That process was adopted by the board at MDX. In fact, we've got an agreement in principle, actually all laid out, between us and the state of Florida for a, a transfer and fee simple of the property and the operations of the Miami Intermodal Center. The issue is that state statute that creates MDX, subsection 7 of 348 part 1, clearly states that we were created and our intent was to do these type of things, but it requires an approval by the Miami-Dade County Commission to be able to operate. So we're, we've been in the process of trying to get that approval from the county. We've had hurdles for the last two years almost with airport issues and so on and so forth. It was interesting that right before that meeting, we were delivered a proposal by the airport. And it basically said, you know, uh, all you have to do is comply with our bond indenture of sec Section 707 in a conceptual phase. And once we give you that certificate, you're good to go. You don't have to come back to the airport. You can continue with your procurement. We don't have to be involved in your procurement. They've really, really simplified what has been dragged out for almost two years between us and the airport. So my comment to the deputy director of the airport, the chief financial officer at the airport, is this doesn't require me to have to go back to the airport three or four times because of this indenture language, then I'm good with it. I'm okay presenting a concept, getting a certificate, and moving on. That doesn't require me to expend a heck of a lot of money. And I don't want this board ever, this board, future boards, this authority to be held hostage over a certificate, you know, issue one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So the presentation was made by F. Dot, F. Dot pressed the issue of we need a decision on the governance. They asked the transit director get up, to get up, and the video is available, I think, online already, so you can watch the video. Transit director got up and said, you know, I thought we can do it, Miami-Dade County, but we can't. MDX has the capacity to do it right now. The airport got up and said, I wish we can do it, but we can't. MDX has the capacity to do it right now. Again, it's funny because it goes full circle. The same discussion that happened at the steering committee for the, the MIC occurred at the dais where the commissioners all said, maybe the right thing to do is to move this forward with MDX. And that included the chairman. Now, what they agreed to was to have the director of transit prepare a report and I think she's going to have to present it December 1st to the full county commission um, on a recommendation or a path forward. There was an agenda item on the dais that I think Commissioner Sosa requested, and it was more of a due diligence. What can be built at the property to support? And I think that the committee was like, that's okay to do it, but that's putting the cart before the horse. We need to figure out who's going to operate and move this forward. So she's been asked to come back by December 1st and present all of those issues. They asked me some specific questions about what would happen, you know, if we were to take it over, and they understand that the joint development is supposed to offset the operations and maintenance. But at some point, if there's positive revenue, what happens with it? They wanted it to go to transit capital. My response was, that's already been resolved. The Florida DOT and Miami Dade Expressway Authority already agreed at 100% of any upside on that deal would go to priority projects of the MPO, 100% of them. In fact, the way we put the agreement together was that that allocation doesn't occur till December 31st after Florida DOT has its allocations to each district because what I did not want to happen was that the MIC become a net zero gain for this community. I wanted it to be above and beyond. So the allocations that typically come to this community through the state would occur 
They usually occur in the July-August time frame. Then gaming occurs. DOT prepares its capital program. They fund, they fund the MPO priorities. And let's say there's 50 priorities and they only have money to do the first 10. In theory, if there was an upside, after that, if there was a positive revenues, then you would say, hey, let's put that money to the other priorities, whether it's number 11, 12, 13, whatever that number is. They understood that, okay? They also asked the question of right of first refusal. What happens if MDX isn't around? You know, they wanted the state uh, to get the first right. They wanted the airport to get the first right of refusal. The way that the agreement is structured, it, it's a state asset. This, it's state who would have the first right of refusal, and then we can actually ask the county if they want it. And I think the way we drafted it is for the county to get the first right of refusal on that particular issue. Um, so those types of questions are what the transit director has to report back to the Board of County Commission. And then hopefully we'll move this along. I will tell you, board members, committee members, we have not expended any more money on the MIC. It's been over a year that we got to a point where we said enough is enough. It's out of our hands, and I'm not going to continue to spin our wheels to chase something. If the county doesn't want us to have it, then they can take it. And I think that was what exactly what uh, Secretary Pagel said on behalf of the state of Florida. We're prepared to hand the keys over to Miami-Dade County, but you've got to move, take action on this. And I just wanted to give you those two updates because there is some movement, and maybe the needle is turning, and maybe people are starting to read these annual reports and see that we keep our commitments. Um, Mr. Mr. Director, if you could make sure you include... You're recognized, Mr. Tre Martinez. I apologize, Mr. Treasurer. Uh, please make sure that the uh, information you just provided is budget and finance included in your executive report. That it is. I just wanted to give you guys a preview as budget and finance, but yes, it'll be part of my report. Any, any questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. You are recognized, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Director, question on that issue that you discussed on the upside going to projects at MPO, which is a laudable goal, but would that include some funding that stays at, in the operation of the MIG to make sure we have the appropriate ratios? Actually, and, uh, yeah, actually the way that we structured the, when we did our performa, the way that the agreement is structured is it's a waterfall of, of funds, no different than we operate the agency. You first have to meet all of your obligations, including any money we may have loaned ourselves, we have to get that paid back before there's any upside. So this isn't, again, I go back to financial sustainability. We can't get into a deal that is just one-sided. It has to be a self-contained, self-operating. I made this comment to the commission. I said, you know, the state of Florida can decide right now to give it to you, or they can decide to go to the, public se to the private sector as a P3. Private sector can come in, do an analysis, whatever the, 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 the agreement can be or whatever it is. And private sector doesn't get into deals that they're not going to make money on. So if DOT did that and the private sector got into it and they made money, that money would go to the private sector and go to their shareholders and possibly would go to invest in other projects in Chicago or New York or Indiana or whatever. This structure... The reason it was decided for MDX is that this allows the structure to keep the money local. We're almost like a conduit. And this notion that the P3s are panacea that has free money, I mean, there's consultants here, there's bankers here, and there's people that watch all the time. I've yet to see a deal that doesn't include government somehow carrying a risk or being a signator on some kind of financial instrument that would reduce interest rates for the private side. So at the end of the day, you know, MDX was created for a reason, and the MIC or moving projects, comprehensive projects forward, you know, that require a lot, they call it lasagna, we should call it paella in, in Miami, of funding, that's the reason MDX was created. So, you know, we'll see how it all plays out. Any, Thank you for that opportunity, sir. Uh, Mr. Executive Director. I, I have one, this may be a simple question, but uh, have we established the, the benefits? You know, I know we've been wanting to get um, this opportunity and, you know, we have analyzed thoroughly the benefits of taking over this, uh, the operations of that, and obviously it has to make business sense from a financial perspective, you know, uh, what potential benefits would we have? And I know we have an arrangement with FDOT that's a 50-50 split. 
if, um, if I'm correct in that, but if you can just give me a quick overview as to why, and I know the answer, by the way, Mr. Executive Director, but I think it's important for some of the new board members, why is it that we want to do this and what is the benefit to MDX to uh, be given this opportunity to uh, operate uh, and manage the, the MIC? Again, uh, it's it, like I said at the commission, this is not about MDX making money to build more toll roads, period. In fact, we created a separate enterprise to keep that separate. The reason it's important for MDX to get involved in this is, again, I said, we were created as an as a, as a authority under the Florida Expressway Authorities Act, but those authors of the legislation included a subsection, subsection 7, that said that the authority can get involved in multimodal corridors, multi intermodal facilities, so on and so forth, so long as the county commission was okay with it. I think what this does, Mr. Chairman, is just like our strategic plan is looking beyond the automobile. And I know that every time I speak about this, somebody cringes because of its, they consider it diversion. This is not about diversion of funds. This is not about diversion of toll revenues. This is about improving mobility in an urbanized area, Miami-Dade County. It's no different than any other urbanized area in the world. There is a s simple fact. We have limited space for pavement. We have, luckily, an improving economy and more visitors coming into Miami-Dade County every, every day. There physically is not an ability for us at MDX to solve all of our transportation problems by just adding highways. What we need to do is figure out a way to move people and goods in a more safe and efficient manner. And part of that safety and, and efficiency is what do you do within your facilities? That's why we're hardening our shoulders to run buses adjacent to our travel lanes on the shoulder. That's why we're looking at a strategic plan that says let's partner with our transit agency and figure out if we can use our assets for stations for potential east-west rail. This puts us in the realm of being a mobility agency rather than just an expressway authority in the short. Last question about that is timeline based on the county commission's uh, presentation on December 1st. When do you anticipate some type of activity uh, coming now, forth? Now you're asking me to be a, 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 <laughs> a sooth. I, I have no idea, sir. I, this has been going on for two years. I have no idea what will happen after December 1st. It could be quick. It could be another year or two. I don't know. But I know that FDOT has gotten to the point where they are right. pressing the issue. Nothing has changed from our end. We, I know we have a, a, a MIC committee. Uh, and any reason to convene that committee at this point? No new Nothing. data or anything to us to do at this point? Okay. Nothing has changed. Correct. Right. Any questions before we move forward to announcements? Okay. Uh, who does the announcements? Uh, would you, I could read the announcements or oh. Mr. Mr. General you, Counsel, I would welcome you, the opportunity for you to read those announcements. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> we have an operations committee meeting on December 3rd at 10 a.m. at the MDX boardroom. We have a board of directors meeting on December 8th in the MDX boardroom. And we have the attorney client privilege meeting, the shade meeting regarding the ETCC litigation on December 16th at 10.30 a.m. Does anybody have any questions of our general counsel about the announcements? Maria Lisa. There's one more meeting on the 8th, which is the intergovernmental meeting prior to the board meeting at 3. Okay. But I sent the notice out yesterday. Okay. With uh, no other comments, uh, motion to adjourn. All right. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, board members, for your participation. Have a great day. We're